Thank you very much. Um, while we get started, I think the thing about Takasubu is you see it when you look for it. And, and I remember when I was doing my training, I'd go between two hospitals. And in one hospital, they always did an LV-gram after an acute MI. And in another hospital, they didn't and they get an echo the next morning or something like that. And it was like there was an outbreak of this at the hospital where we did an LV-gram right after uh, finding normal coronaries. And at the other one, They'd say, oh, and there must have been spontaneous lysis, and they get the echo the next day, and it's a little bit low, but not bad. And so you have to look uh, to find it. So a little bit of history. Um, it was first described in five Japanese patients, mostly men, in 1990. Um, it, uh, as everybody here probably knows, it, it is named because of the similarity between the LV and systole and the narrow neck and wide base of a Japanese octopus trap. Uh, also called apical ballooning syndrome, broken heart syndrome, and, and stress cardiomyopathy is probably one of the more uh, common and, and contemporary terms. In terms of diagnosis, this is one of the clearest, the Mayo Clinic diagnostic criteria, and there has to be transient regional wall motion abnormalities, typically not seen in a single coronary distribution, no angiographic evidence of obstructive coronary disease or acute plaque rupture, though there may be other concurrent coronary disease, non-obstructive, and up to 15 to 20 percent of patients who have Takasubos. New electrocardiographic abnormalities, modest troponin elevation, so you never get the same peak of an acute MI, plaque rupture MI, but elevated, and the absence of a FIO or myocarditis. The epidemiology was that it was rarely reported b before 2001, and that's when there started to become literature, uh, worldwide literature. Um, and the current estimates are it is about one to two uh, of, uh, of suspected acute MIs. And this is hard to tell because a lot of times people don't look. In the Horizons AMI study, for example, they found that 2% of women had what they thought was uh, a Takasubo's cardiomyopathy. They saw it in none of the men, and these are patients who had gotten um, a LV gram at the time of their presentation. As I'll talk about it, 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 it was thought to always be related to emotional or physical stress, and the typical presentation mimicked uh, uh, a standard acute coronary syndrome with chest pain, dyspnea, syncope, rarely cardiac arrest, and felt to be arrhythmias. Um, the EKG typically shows ST elevation, uh, with T wave inversions and the biomarkers, both troponin and, NT and BNP are elevated. And this is, um, I have a couple slides here from what probably is the most important work on uh, Takasubos, and it's from the Takasubo registry that Christian Templin um, uh, had organized, and, and this is the, by far the largest collection of these patients. And here you see the classic pattern of presentation, where it typically is women light blue, much more than men down here, which is in contrast to uh, Japan, typically at postmenopausal with a peak here in the um, 60s. And you can see troponins elevated in almost 90 percent, ST elevations in 44 percent, very uh, uh, much less likely for ST depressions. There is prolongation of the QT interval uh, in almost 50 percent of the people, and that's felt to be uh, one of the reasons why there are arrhythmias associated with this. And in this registry, half of the patients had some history, remote, current, active, uh, of either psychiatric or a neurologic condition, including epilepsy, seizures, uh, as well as depression. Now, in terms of triggering factors of these patients, about a third of the uh, triggers were uh, physical, 28% uh, were emotional, 8 had both, but over a quarter of patients had no identifiable trigger in this registry. Men tended to have more physical triggers, women tended to have more female triggers, and here's a breakdown of the different types of triggers, whether it is grief, loss, panic, interpersonal conflict or anger or frustration, uh, physical triggers looking at respiratory distress, um, post-surgical uh, or fractures, um, or CNS events. Now what is seen on the left here, again this is from the registry, that compared to patients with typical acute coronary syndrome, patients with Takasubos are much more likely to have a lower ejection fraction on presentation. Uh, many with less than 50 percent. And in terms of the pattern, this is the classic pattern of Takasubos. 80 percent of patients have this apical ballooning, but there is recognition of uh, different types. This is a midventricular 
uh, pattern, which is seen in 50%, so it's a little bit like a collar on the ventricle that uh, is squeezed right in the middle. There is uh, more, much more infrequently a basal type where there is um, good uh, 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 contraction of the apex, um, but the basal is not affected. And then these focal, again, only 1.5% for not much. So this is certainly the classic, but there are these other variants that have been reported. And why this is, is I think probably gets a lot to what is understood or not understood about the pathophysiology um, about uh, Takasubos. And, and one of the, I think, the best hypothesis is that this is clearly coming from something in the brain uh, where there's an excitation of the autonomic nervous center that goes through the spinal cord so that you get uh, stimulation um, through uh, neuronal pathways uh, or post-synaptic uh, um, excitation of the beta receptors in the heart. And this leads to a uh, catecholamine or adrenergic toxicity. Why it happens in some areas versus the other is probably related to different differential expression of the different um, adrenergic receptors in the body. Now you can get, then get into um, sort of some post uh, um, uh, uh, post-initiation problems where you do then get uh, adrenal stimulation because there's hypotension, which causes circulating catecholamines to increase, and get into this cycle where you can then get lower ejection fraction and, and, and into the cardiogenic shock cycle. Why it happens um, is, again, largely unknown. Is the fact that it's mostly postmenopausal women mean that there's estrogen dependent on this? Uh, I think that's uh, uh, certainly a good hypothesis. So, how do we manage these patients? Um, because there is this idea of the catecholamine toxicity, sedation, anxiolytics, analgesia is therapeutic. It not only makes the patient feel better, but it may be making the heart better. If possible, trying to treat with combined alpha beta blockers to reverse the toxicity and avoid unopposed or, uh, or uh, beta uh, blockade, similar to sort of cocaine um, ingestion toxicity. If hypotensive or cardiogenic shock, then you have two big questions. Is there evidence of left ventricular outflow tract obstruction? If there is none, then we typically will use the standard therapies, decreasing preload, afterload, the judicious use of inotropes, probably dobutamine or dopamine, to try to manage the dysfunction until it recovers. The problem really comes when there's left ventricular outcome uh, tract obstruction. And here's uh, where Paradoxically, peripheral vasoconstrictors may help because they may increase the afterload enough. Judicious uh, use of um, volume resuscitation to try to decrease the LVOT obstruction may also help to get the heart out of what can be a suicide type of uh, um, uh, situation where it is squeezing against this uh, very uh, tight left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. There are also, I think, in these patients, these, especially the worst, you need to consider mechanical support device. And balloon pumps are often advocated. I would actually say that PVADs are more uh, effective. And it, in, the impella actually has, um, theoretically, and, and, and what we've seen, the ability to unload or decompress the LV and bypass that LVOT so that you can um, get out of the, the cycle uh, in the worst cases. If there's pulmonary edema, then diuretics, morphine, um, and PA catheters can be helped to vo guide volume. So what are the r rates of cardiogenic shock? In the registry, cardiogenic shock happened in about 10%, death in 4% of these patients. Uh, compared to patients who had an acute coronary syndrome, classic ACS, uh, the outcomes in hospital were very similar between Takasubo in blue and ACS in red. And if you look at the short and long-term outcomes, you see what is the typical pattern that we, um, of reduced left ventricular function that improves even by hospital recovery and returns to normal in most patients afterwards. If you're looking at, uh, this is 30-day um, outcomes where you can see that overall death here about 4 or 5% at 30 days, low rate of recurrence in yellow here at 30 days. Long-term outcomes from the Mayo experience, there's an initial risk, but then it actually stabilizes. And in the long-term follow-up here, again, the recurrence rate is again uh, of, of a second, uh, having a second event is in um, the 10 to 15 percent when you get to five years. So there are no good tools for identifying patients at highest risk, except perhaps that they've had already more than one event. And nothing has been proven to prevent it. There are no trials um, in the large registry uh, 
there was an association between the use of ACE inhibitors or ARBs and lower risk of recurrence. There was no association between beta blockers. It's observational, um, but I typically will treat patients with ARBs um, or, angi or ACE inhibitors and then treat their other CV or metabolic risk factors uh, uh, as well. So to conclude, Takasubos is infrequent but not rare acute cardiomyopathy that presents similar to ACS. The etiology, pathophysiology, mechanical recovery is poorly understood, and there certainly are no randomized trials of that to help guide our therapy. Most patients will completely recover without in-hospital or late-term complications, but up to 10 percent will be complicated by cardiogenic shock. Um, that combined with the likely toxicity of many of our cardiogenic shock treatments, uh, and the left ventricular outflow tract obstruction can greatly complicate it. And the treatment really does require the early recognition of cardiogenic shock and then close follow-up with imaging and hemodynamic monitoring to guide therapy, which in some cases does benefit from mechanical supports.